Hi guys, uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you all uh, see me and hear me? Uh, just give me a quick confirmation if I am live uh, and you guys can see me and uh, hear me. So I'm uh, taking a class on YouTube after a very, very long time. Uh, uh, so uh, we have been obviously in contact on an academy. We've been having uh, classes almost on a daily basis. Uh, but YouTube, it's been quite a long uh, time. So uh, I hope there are no audio visual issues. Uh, and we can start so this is a new series for the next three days we shall be having these classes for about 45 minutes or so wherein we shall be discussing about the most important images right so as you can see from the title it will be like 100 images in order of importance so in the recent exams I've seen a very typical pattern you know of radio questions which are getting asked again and again you know very repeated images are coming and it's it, it's criminal to make the mistakes from you know questions that have been asked and uh, especially in radiology um, because it is a very scoring subject right so that's what we want to do and make sure that these hundred images and everything you know that we need to know about it uh, we know all right so a quick run through of these images so hundred divided by three so we'll be doing roughly 35 30 to 35 images every day uh, for the next three days right so that's the plan uh, the pdf will be available i mean I, i'll save the annotations also and give you the annotated version if you want if my handwriting works for you uh, otherwise i would recommend you make your own notes i've already posted the telegram on the I, i already posted the pdf on the telegram group for those of you who do not know it's uh, radiology with dr zainab Bora. right uh, okay so uh, let's begin and then all your other questions uh, we will do all right so um yeah, I mean, see, this will be a supplement. No amount of revision is enough for images and, you know, important stuff. So, you just take it as a revision. If you do not want to see it live, you see it on 2x later on. That's also cool, right? But just do a quick revision, even if you've seen, you know, previous sessions. Yeah, yeah, this video will be saved on Unacademy's YouTube channel, like always. Yeah, I think you guys are new to Unacademy YouTube. I mean, earlier I used to have students who were on YouTube, but not uh, using the app. I think this bunch of students is the other way around because we haven't really interacted much on YouTube. So everything will remain saved on, uh, you know, their YouTube, on Academy's YouTube channel and uh, you can access it anytime you want. All right. But because there are so many videos, it te tends to get lost amidst all of them. So try and save the links of these, right? Okay. Let's start. Uh, for those of you who are new, I am Zainab. Uh, I have done my MBBS from Ames, New Delhi and then I did my radiology from Ames and then I did my senior residency from Ames and now I am here. Uh, so this is the schedule which has been going on. So we are having the must-know topic series. Those of you who are unaware of it, we are doing the 50 must-know topics, you know, in order, uh, in no particular order. But uh, uh, we are on to the 13th part and we are doing them in great detail. So uh, do uh, see these classes, all subjects encompassing uh, series. So it will be very, very useful for your exams is what I believe. Okay, link of telegram group, just search radiology with Dr. Zainab Bora, you will find it. Is it stuck or is there no voice? Is there any such issues? Please, no. Huh? Okay, na? Huh. Embryology may vascular ka will cover. Embryology is way down on 6th, hai na? Okay, so I will definitely cover uh, arterial and venous. I think that's what you are saying. Huh? Wo kar lenge. Okay. No means uh, you can hear me and see me, right? Okay, chalo, wonderful. So those of you who are... Looking to subscribe for plus subscription, today is the, no, 31st is the last day for this Unlock 20 offer, which is very good. You, I think it is the maximum discount that, uh, you know, an academy has ever given on plus subscription. So you can, uh, you know, avail it now. Yeah, yes, only English, no Hindi, done. Okay, you can use my code, which is ZVORA in order to subscribe. You can get Iconic as well as um, plus subscription. So Iconic will give you access to Prep Ladder as well as an academy, right? And uh, these are the batch courses. So this is the one which has started on 25th. Uh, I'll be having a class with uh, Dr. Santosh from Medicine on 1st and 2nd, where we'll be discussing an integrated approach to various emergencies, right? So that is on the cards. So this is about it. And QBank 2.0 is also coming up. Okay? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So now starting with the first most important image. This is an image which is extremely, extremely important. And in every exam, you will get a question on this and uh, you should not get this wrong not in exam not in life do not miss this because this is a li this is a life threatening emergency and if you miss it you lose the patient so can you tell me this i'll give you the history also very short clue i will give you for every case so you'll have severe pain abdomen with guarding with rigidity so anytime the biggest clue is 
abdominal symptoms but x-ray given is chest x-ray so there's only one possible diagnosis and now when you have pain abdomen guarding rigidity peritonitis symptoms and then chest x-ray is given straight away your eyesight should go where correct your eye should go directly under the diaphragm if you see black air under the right diaphragm the diagnosis is air under the diaphragm perforation peritonitis or any time perforation of hollow viscous happens we call it pneumoperitoneum right so you want to consider pneumoperitoneum perforation remember look under the right diaphragm not on the left diaphragm because there you have the fundus which can give you normal air right so we are not looking here we are looking under the right diaphragm where you see black air it is perforation or pneumoperitoneum usually they will ask you diagnosis or they will ask you what to do next so if asked next look look out for the options if you have iv fluids or you know resuscitation go for that first obviously never refuse iv fluids never refuse resuscitation for the patient or for the exam and eventually once the patient is stabilized the management is going to be exploratory laparotomy which is going to be there in your option so you can get multiple correct or you can have any one of these as options so this is what we are going to be doing next the most common organ to perforate is going to be the stomach right you know uh, stomach is going to perforate so you're going to have history of some sort of a peptic ulcer or maybe the patient is taking nsaids right so aisa kuch history the buzzword would be given in the exam and also remember one more point do you know any organs in the abdomen which if perforate do not lead to pneumoperitoneum which will not lead to air under the diaphragm one is going to be appendix so remember if appendix perforates there is no pneumoperitoneum you have a localized collection called phlegmon if gall bladder perforates you do not have perforation you do not have air which comes out right so remember this as an extra edge question two organs which if perforate will not have pneumoperitoneum theek hai going ahead to the next image this is the kind of speed i have to maintain if you want to see 100 images in less than 3 hours and if you want to discuss important points i hope that's all right okay so what do we have here what is this diagnosis again something which they'll give you that there is history of trauma and the person presents with chest pain and uh, you did the chest x ray and this is what you find correct this is pneumothorax so how do we make a diagnosis of pneumothorax so for a pneumothorax diagnosis one here which side is involved right or left guys this is right isn't it so on the right side you know that there is this increased blackness increased lucency the key is there are going to be no markings this is just pure black air without any lung marking so this is not normal lung normal lung will have all of these markings which you are not seeing here right so whenever you see air without markings and then you have a line demarcating it from the normal underlying lung or a lung which could be collapsed this line is your visceral pleura so this is a visceral pleural line and you are having this air yeah yeah this will remain on youtube yeah so we have this air without bronchovascular markings first point second point you will have the visceral pleural line separating it from the underlying collapsed lung this is how we make a diagnosis of pneumothorax how will the mediastinum shift guys ipsilateral shift contralateral shift you will have a contralateral mediastinal shift now this question will never come as a radiology diagnostic question this question will always come as a management question with integration with surgery so how do you manage first of all tell me what is tension pneumothorax if there is gross mediastinal shift do i call it tension pneumothorax looks very bad must be tension no how do we call tension pneumothorax it's a clinical diagnosis is based on the vitals of the patient right so here the question would be how do you manage the patient so for management we have to see the vitals if the patient is unstable means patient is in shock what kind of shock usually results in pneumothorax physiology wise it's an obstructive shock right so because of this mediastinal shift the superior vena cava the inferior vena cava the vessels get compressed so basically the heart, the blood flow is obstructed so it's an obstructive shock right so if the patient is unstable basically if the patient is in shock we call that as a tension pneumothorax understood so tension pneumothorax is on the basis of vitals how do you manage this patient emergent needle thoracostomy so you immediately want to put in a needle here needle thoracostomy the needle would be in the fifth intercostal space for an adult 
second intercostal space for a child. So adult, fifth intercostal space, child, second intercostal space, followed by ICD insertion in the fifth intercostal space in the triangle of safety. If the patient is stable, if the patient is stable, then you can directly go ahead and place an ICD in the same fifth intercostal space triangle of safety. Yes, everybody, thoracotomy would be a surgical procedure, right? Where you are opening up the patient. That is not really indicated in pneumothorax. But when you have hemothorax and a lot of bleeding, then you know that becomes an indication of a thoracotomy. Okay, everybody understood this. So, this is about pneumothorax diagnosis pooching and they'll ask you the management. So, that is very, very important. This is always asked. Do not make this mistake. So, number 1 to 10, to you have to know everything about it. So, on the same lines, we know that pneumothorax is also something that can be diagnosed on ultrasound. In trauma setting, this ultrasound is called as EFAST, right? Where extended means about thorax, right? We are evaluating thorax in addition to the abdomen. So, FAST means focused assessment sonography for trauma. Here, we look for hemoperitoneum. When we extend it, it's for pneumothorax, hemothorax. So, what do we see? This is an M mode ultrasound, M for motion. Here, you want to look for these lines. Yesterday, also, we were talking about this. When you see lines and you see this granular beach, this is called as C shore sign. The trick is to remember, we don't go to a beach during COVID times, during pandemic times. We go to a beach during normal times, right? So, a seashore sign is a sign of a normal lung. On the other hand, when this granularity is missing, apne ko khali lines, 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 you're only seeing lines. That is called as the barcode sign or also called as, yes, stratosphere, right? You have all of these layers in the stratosphere. Very nice. Barcode and stratosphere sign, this is seen in pneumothorax. Yeah, so these are the two signs that we want to remember on an M mode ultrasound. So, this is about pneumothorax, image number 3. Done. Going on to image number 4. What do we have here? The abnormal side is the left side where you are having this opacity. This opacity has this meniscus, this curve to it. This indicates that this is fluid. This is effusion. So, this is called as the meniscus sign, also called as elysis S curve. This is something that we are going to be seeing in plural effusion. If it is trauma, we can call it hemothorax, right? So, this is plural effusion. We are seeing a meniscus sign. One of you saying hydroneumothorax, we will see a flat level. We will not see this meniscus. You see a solid level, air fluid level, that is hydroneumothorax, all right? So, this is plural effusion, most sensitive investigation. Anytime we talk about any fluid, answer is going to be ultrasound. Pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, ascites. Most sensitive, ultrasound, right? Fluid, ultrasound. Remember this thumb rule in the mind. If asked what is the most sensitive x-ray to pick up minimal fluid, to pick up minimal effusion, we keep the patient on the side which is involved. So, the dependent side would be having the fluid. So, that is ipsilateral, lateral decubitus. So, you lie down on the side, the side which has effusion will be dependent, all right? So, ipsilateral, lateral decubitus. On a frontal x-ray, the earliest sign is going to be the blunting of the CP angle. So, earliest sign on a frontal PA view is blunting of the CP angle. What is CP angle? Costophrenic angle. So, this angle that you see right here, this angle would start to have this fluid. It would start to get blunted because of gravity dependent fluid uh, going down. Alright, so this is blunting of CP angle that we will have as the earliest finding. Okay, so this is plural effusion. Yes, so this is about number four. Going on to the, okay, going on to the next image. What is this? Again, something jo her exam me you are getting. A young male patient who is having a limited flexion. He cannot bend forwards as much as he could. So, there is flexion deformity. There is pain which is inflammatory in nature which resolves with activity but it is more at rest. What is the diagnosis? This is the first time somebody has told me beautiful handwriting in my life. Thank you so much. So, this is ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah, so ankylosing spondylitis is the diagnosis. Young male patient, inflammatory backache. Plus, you would have a question um, uh, like bilateral heel pain, something that came in the last NEAT exam. This is because of 
a symptom complex called enthesopathy right so enthesopathy is something which will result in pain and inflammation at the tendinous origin so because you have pain at the insertion of tendo achilles you will have a uh, pain bilateral heel pain right so anywhere ligament or tendon inserts you will have pain which is enthesopathy apart from that you can also have in the history history of uveitis bilateral redness of the eye is something that was asked last time so this is ankylosing spondylitis what do you see on the imaging so the earliest manifestation before we see all of these changes on the x ray the first joints to be involved is sacroiliac joint so we will see sacroiliitis as the earliest manifestation and this is picked up on which modality so most sensitive investigation is going to be mri all right so remember mri will pick up bone marrow edema mri will pick up sacroiliitis after this the sacroiliac joints will fuse hence the name ankylosis after this changes will go in the spine so spine mein kya milega we will have a completely fused spine you will have these vertical processes connecting all the vertebra and the vertebra becomes one fixed unit like a bamboo so this is likened to a bamboo spine very very important image the complete spine is fused plus can you see how the interspinous ligament is also very ossified very calcified this is called as the dagger sign that all of you were correctly picking up so there is ossification of interspinous ligament and you also have this bamboo spine which results because of a fixed flexion uh, because of a fixed fusion of all the all the vertebral bodies okay so this is bamboo spine dagger sign together it can also be called as a tram track sign all right one of you asked how to distinguish from pot spine remember pot spine will not result in this kind of ankylosis of the complete vertebra in the end stage you might have two vertebrae which might be fused very rarely but what you would be asked in the exam as far as pot spine is concerned is a paradiscal involvement a paradiscal inflammation in the form of an mri you will never be asked to make a diagnosis of pot spine on x ray remember that you will be asked on an mri an image which we will see in the coming Uh, images all right so this is about angspond everybody are you clear with this clinically there is a modified schober test that i am going to do to quantify the limitation of flexion right so remember modified schober test is done which will show us that the flexion is limited okay so this is about angspond young male hla b27 okay hla b27 fine okay letters are not visible letters are visible no to everybody it visible hai beautiful handwriting also i got okay so number 6 we have one differential of ang spine so we have both the c spines which are there so here in the first image can you see how the complete spine is fused so this is how ang spine will appear ankylosing spondylitis another differential of ang spine is what wherein you have this flowing sort of ossification along the anterior longitudinal ligament so let me just zoom in for you the difference here there is no thickening as such complete spine is fused but here what do we see we see that just along the anterior longitudinal ligament just along the anterior part of the vertebrae we have this flowing ossification candle wax sort of an appearance right dropping like candle wax what is the diagnosis this is dish what does dish stand for diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis no need to remember the point is that there is hyperostosis and nobody knows why okay so here you are having hyperostosis along the anterior longitudinal ligament this is also referred to as forestrier's disease also called as forestrier's disease the main difference one you have to see what part of the spine is involved secondly you want to see the age this would be a young person the pain would have started at 20 30 years of age this person would always be an elderly person more than 50 years of age so big difference clinically age x ray wise c thin complete fusion of the spine second flowing thick ossification only along all rest of the joints are completely normal is this clear everybody so this is about ang spine versus dish number 6 image done going on to number oh god going on to number 7 yeah what is this renal mass i'll give you a history a history that you love 
This is a banker who presents to you with a renal mass on a workup for insurance. This is the same exact question which has been coming. They keep changing the image, but somehow history of that banker who is undergoing some uh, insurance this thing and getting detected with a mass is same. So do not rely on the history. Do not make the diagnosis on terms of the banker getting insurance this thing because they'll change the history. AML is not related to bankers. All right, just a disclaimer. Do not get, get that confusion. So how do we make the diagnosis? we make the diagnosis as this mass lesion in the right kidney yeah so right kidney we are having a mass here it is just about match the color where do you think this color goes in this normal ct can you see this kala color this black color anywhere else same same color color is not as black as air but you can see that okay the subcutaneous fat is having the same color as this so can i say that okay if fat is this density this lesion must also be fat containing it must be having gross fat yeah so anytime we have a renal mass with fat there's only one diagnosis that you want to make the name itself will tell you it has fat angiomyolipoma a n l Angiomyolipoma means it has blood vessel, it has muscle, it has fat. But the fat is what gives it its characteristic appearance and you can see some muscle density. You might see some aneurysmal dilated vessels also inside it. But what gives you your diagnosis is the association with fat, right? The black color of the fat tells you it's an angiomyolipoma. Yes, everybody, you are diagnosing this correctly. Now, we go to the various questions associated with it. Where do you see AML? Correct. It is always seen in relation with tuberous sclerosis, not with VHL. VHL is going to be RCC, right? Clear cell RCC. So, tuberous sclerosis ke saath association hota hai because this is also a hematoma. In tuberous sclerosis, you have a mutation in chromosome 9 and 16, which is hamartin and tuberin gene which encodes basically an mTOR activation, unregulated mTOR activation ho jata hai, which leads to hematomas all over the body, right? So this is also an example of a hematoma because it has an angio component, which is also hematomatous, which is not developed well. Do you think there can be bleeding? This can lead to aggressive retroperitoneal bleed? Yes, it can. What do we call that syndrome? When there is an RP bleed secondary to an angiomyolipoma, that is called as Wunderlich syndrome. Yes, it is indeed HMB45 positive. And if you want to know more, this also comes under a category of tumors which are called picomas, perivascular endothelial cell omas, picomas. All right. So, picomas are tumors which are S100 positive, HMB45 positive. So, they have this uh, dual lineage and they are called picomas. All right. So, AML also comes under um, this category. Alright, so remember angiomyolipoma, RP bleed, Wunderlich syndrome. Treatment, so because there is this risk of bleeding, if we see vessels which are very much dilated, we need to treat this tumor. So the treatment can either be angioembolization or you can do a partial nephrectomy. Now my question to you guys, why partial nephrectomy? Why are we not doing complete nephrectomy here? If there is such a big tumor, why are we trying to save the kidney? Because it's syndromic, right? So you can have multiple AMLs. You can also have RCC in tuberous sclerosis. So because there is a higher risk of renal cell cancer, multiple angiomyolipomas, we want to save the kidney as far as possible. So this is the treatment option. And if you cannot, if you have so many tumors, then do we also have a drug, guys, that we can actually give in very uh, severe cases where we can't do nephrectomy? mTOR inhibitors, do you know mTOR inhibitors uh, that can be given? So yes, sirolimus, evrolimus can also be tried when surgery is not possible. Okay, so this is this has become an entire class only on AML. Fine, so this is about angiomyolipoma and all the points that you basically need to know about it. Okay, going on to number 8. Gyne, TVS scan has been shown, transvaginal ultrasound. You know that because you're seeing a large uterus and within the uterus, you are having all of these vesicles. So the patient will give you a history of amenorrhea. And what you would notice is that along with this history of amenorrhea, along with this history of amenorrhea, you're also having uh, a uterus size, a fundus size, which is much greater than the period of gestation. All right. Wait, let me just block the spammer. So, basically, history of amenorrhea, what you will have is uh, uh, the 
uterine size will be greater than the period of gestation right so when we look at the ultrasound here you would see this appearance correct which is called as the snowstorm appearance or cluster of grapes appearance right so this is basically your molar pregnancy so this is hydatidiform mole why the name hydatidiform mole because this looks like a hydatid cyst hydatid cyst will also have such a honeycomb appearance so yes this is a complete mole as you are all correctly saying an incomplete mole will have these grapes in addition to fetal parts what is the management apart from management the beta hcg levels if done would be markedly raised particularly in a complete mole more than an incomplete mole the treatment is asked a lot of time it is never uh, uh, remember it is dnc is never to be done the treatment is suction and evacuation right so suction and evacuation is never to be curated right because that increases the risk of what Asherman syndrome, right? So that increases the risk of adhesions, intrauterine adhesions, which is Asherman syndrome. You want to put in a Carmen scanula and suck out these vesicles. All right. So this is suction and evacuation, which is the treatment of H mole. Take care. This question always, always comes. What about this? I'll give you a history. There's history of in vitro fertilization, and the patient suddenly develops acute pain abdomen. What is the diagnosis? when you are seeing both the ovaries these are two ovaries which have very large follicles massively bulky ovaries with very very large follicles this is ohss which is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome so what we do in ivf we are giving these stimulating drugs which will make good big follicles that can be harvested and ivf can be done sometimes that will over fire and you will have very very large follicles which might rupture and they can be third space losses like pleural effusion and ascites so this is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome which is an adverse effect of giving very very high doses of follicular stimulating drugs so this you will have history of ivf same appearance if i tell you that the last case which had molar pregnancy can the same appearance also occur in some other lesion yes it can occur if you have theca lutein cysts right so remember theca lutein cysts are also because of very high beta hcg i told you that beta hcg is very high so you can actually have a over stimulation of the ovary so this becomes theca lutein cysts which are in association with molar pregnancy now so many of you saying pcos completely wrong pcos will not show you this appearance pcos kya dikhega see this so do not make this mistake number 10 we have polycystic ovarian syndrome gross difference what do we have here peripherally arranged follicles which are too many and too small so remember the operative number 10 these follicles here in the polycystic ovarian syndrome are going to be less than 10 mm in size and they are going to be more than 10 in number so many follicles which are all very very small will you remember 10 less than 10 mm more than 10 and because of this very symmetrical peripheral enlargement this gives rise to a string of pearls synia so it looks like a necklace or a string of pearls that we are seeing here bilateral ovaries would be enlarged but unlike ohss follicles are very small why are they very small what is the problem in pcos in polycystic ovarian syndrome the problem is there is no ovulation which is happening right so we are having an ovulation so when there is no ovulation do you think there will be any dominant follicle any big follicle no so there are all of these tiny tiny follicles no dominant follicle and all of these follicles arranged in the periphery in addition what is the most specific feature we see that this is the central stroma yeah there is hyperthecosis also which is there in pcos that leads to hirsutism hyperandrogenism increased testosterone so we are finding that the central stroma is also increased in volume as well as echogenicity it's more white it's more thicker so that is what is responsible for the hyper uh, androgenic symptoms right so pcos anovulatory symptoms so irregular menstrual cycle anovulation this is responsible for hirsutism so that is the typical clinical feature so the criteria that we know for pcos rotterdam criteria rotterdam criteria will have three things first clinical features anovulation irregular menstrual cycle hirsutism weight gain diabetes mellitus 
biochemical marker second hall mark where you will have raised testosterone you will have raised lh by fsh ratio that is the hall mark and typical ultrasound feature which is the string of pearls appearance that we are seeing for the rotterdam criteria what does it say we need any two out of three to be positive in may say kuch bhi do cheeze we need for the diagnosis as polycystic ovarian syndrome okay everybody so we are on to 10 going on to number 11 we had two questions in the last i i see you on this single image what is this a very large esophagus on barium swallow which tapers distally as a smooth tapering called the bird beak sign yeah so this is the bird beak sign all right so what is the diagnosis here the diagnosis here is achalasia cardia achalasia cardia what what is the pathophysiology so you have the lower esophageal sphincter which is a functional sphincter which does not relax so here you do not have relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter and that is why you do not have any peristalsis across the esophagus so basically this is what we want to test and what is going to be the investigation of choice to make this diagnosis it's a motility disorder right we are seeing les mein problem hai peristalsis nahi ho raha so any time motility disorder m for manometry do not mix manometry with 24 hour ph monitoring manometry is not 24 hour it's a one time thing right so we do a manometry particularly at um, high resolution manometry and what is the classification that we are going to use for manometry something we have studied in our midnight express in detail chicago classification right so we'll use the chicago classification for achalasia cardia diagnosis remember best is manometry apart from that what else do you need to know about achalasia what is not useful was also asked so remember 24 hour ph monitoring is not indicated here that is the investigation of choice for grd reflex right so that was one of the question that which is not useful one more thing about achalasia we do a timed barium swallow remember a timed barium swallow means i will take this barium x ray i i'll ask the patient to drink barium after that i'm going to take serial x rays at 1 minute 2 minutes 5 minutes why i'm doing this so basically i need to know how much is the barium moving with time is the barium column moving down so what we're going to do is we are going to measure this height this will be helpful when after the patient has been managed apne treatment kar liya after that when we repeat we want to see is the height now decreased how much is the response so we measure the barium column height and that basically tells us about the response to treatment what is the treatment uh, no rapte sign is completely different it is seen in malignancy it's going to be an irregular narrowing right so that is completely different not seen what is i saying what is the treatment so treatment used to be traditionally hellers myotomy where we cut out the sphincter the newer treatment is what the newer recent advance is poems what is the poems procedure where you need not open up the patient this is per oral endoscopic myotomy surgery so this is basically a natural orifice procedure through the endoscope only per orally we are removing the sphincter right or the muscle so this is the treatment that we are going to do so we can repeat a timed barium swallow and you will basically no it yeah it comes under the purview of notes procedure which is natural orifice surgeries right so this is about achalasia next this x ray view has come in every exam like not this x ray view but two views dono mein se ek ek view always comes what is this paranasal sinus view this is the waters view to be very precise is it normal waters or is it modified waters view so it is a modified waters view and why i call it modified is because the mouth is open so if it's an open mouth view we call it a modified waters view or the other name would be a peers view so remember peers view and modified waters view are the same if the mouth is closed we call it a traditional waters view okay how do you identify it so you want to look for the maxillary sinuses if they are very well seen it is a waters view so this is the best x ray for 
maxillary sinus remember water's view or tears view is the best for maxillary sinus what can you see here can you see how instead of being black the sinuses also have this level here this indicates that there is sinusitis all right so this is used to pick up opacification of sinuses which indicates sinusitis and why are we making the mouth open we are making the mouth open so that we can also visualize the sphenoid sinus. So, in order to visualize the sphenoid sinus, we'll have the patient keep the mouth open, which gives us an additional sinus. So, remember, modified or open mouth waters, also called as peers. If the mouth is closed, it's a traditional waters view, something that they'll never give you. And the one that you do not have to mix it with is our image number 13, where what do you see? You can see that these bones, which are your pterygoid plates, will actually overlap the maxillary sinus. So, always look x-ray may. Do you see the maxillary sinus very well? If yes, it is peers or waters. If no, if they are completely blocked by the pterygoid plate and my ray is going like this, the face is end on. It is not like this. Here, the ray is passing from the occiput to the chin. This is how we keep the image receptor. So, the chin is open. So that's why you can see no, that the mouth is, the face is facing upwards. That is why this is also called as occipital mental view. Mental means not mental, mental, it means mentum, chin. Alright, so this is occipital mental view, whereas this here is your occipital frontal view. Means, how are the rays passing? The patient is head on, the image receptor is like this and the rays are passing from back to the frontal sinus. Yeah, so this is also called as occipital frontal view, where you best are going to see the frontal sinus. Maxillary sinuses are not going to be seen. Or your view kya hai? Called well view. So, this is the most important view that is being asked in almost all the exams these days. So, in exam, if you can't figure out what are their peers, or what is it? Mark called well. All right. This is the highest chances of getting asked. But just know it's very easy to pick it up. Okay. So, this is frontal sinus. Yeah. So, this is the frontal sinus that uh, you are seeing the best. So, which sinus is best visualized on called well? It is the frontal sinus. Okay, everybody. So, this is about occipital mental view, occipital frontal view, waters view, modified waters, peers view, and called wells view. Right? Done? Okay. Next, we have a child who is presenting with acute pain in the abdomen, uh, the child is crying incessantly and the mother tells you that I am noticing brown stools or I am noticing red current jelly stools. This is occurring predominantly around 6 to 8 months of age. Diagnosis? Yes, we are dealing with a case of intersusception. So, intersusception means telescoping of one bowel into the other. So, when I take an ultrasound, I am going to see one bowel and another bowel. So, I am going to see a bowel within bowel appearance. This is also called as the target sign or the donut sign. So, when given the clinical history and they will ask you what is the initial investigation that you will do? Answer is going to be ultrasound. But when asked what is the best investigation? What is the gold standard investigation? The answer is going to be barium enema. If you do not have barium enema in the option, you have air enema, go for it. If you do not have air enema, you have hydrostatic or saline, edema, uh, saline enema in the options, go for that. So, any sort of enema, if you have, we are going to do that because it is diagnostic as well as therapeutic. So, we will see when we put in the barium, there is a barium enema. When you put the barium, it produces this clot. Wherever there is this intersusception, it will produce this flaw. And what will happen? Because of the barium, we will have this hydrostatic reduction. This will exert a hydrostatic pressure and this bowel loop will come out. Okay. So, this is called as flaw sign. This was asked in the latest uh, FMG exam, right? And the NEAT exam as well. So, we have flaw sign. So, remember best investigation and initial investigation, it's going to be ultrasound. Right, so this is about intersusception, the most common type of intersusception that occurs to at 6 to 8 months, it's going to be the iliopholic type where the ileum goes into the ascending colon. So, iliopholic is the most common and it occurs at 6 to 8 months because of two reasons. One is because of rotavirus vaccination that leads to immune proliferation 
Second is because you are starting complementary feeds at this time, you are going to have these Peyer's patches which undergo hypertrophy. So Peyer's patches are located at the ileum, terminal ileum. So they will hypertrophy, they will act as a lead point and will lead to iliocolic intersusception. So any lesion that leads to intersusception is called as a lead point. In adults, you can have some sort of a polyp, you can have Meckel's diverticulum or you can have malignancy also which can act as a lead point. So particularly if you are faced with an adult patient who has intersusception, always you want to rule out an underlying mass lesion which is a lead point. What vasculitis can also be a risk factor for intersusception? HSP, right? Uh, Henoch, Schoenlein, Purpura, remember is also a cause of intersusception because you will have submucosal hematomas that can lead to this and remember in GI polyps also basically uh, particularly they love to ask you uh, one question wherein you will be given this intersusception and they'll show you mucocutaneous pigmentation so what do you want to keep in mind in that case diagnosis tell me diagnosis tell me chromosome tell me gene tell me age so that would be Peutz-Jagger, right? So Peutz-Jagger, you would have mucocutaneous, uh, uh, this thing, mucocutaneous uh, pigmentation and you would have polyps across the small bubble, stomach, large intestine, right? Which can lead to intersusception, chromosome and gene. It is going to be STK11 and mean age of presentation also, you can remember 11, right? So 11 years, STK11 and what particular malignancy increases per se in Peutz-Jagger? It's going to be pancreatic CA, right? So pancreatic CA has a 110 times increased risk of increasing, of, of you know, occurring in huge sugar. So remember, a lot of malignancies can occur, but pancreatic CA is the one which has the highest risk, okay? So this is about intersusception. Image number 15, again, favorite, favorite, cliched question. Do not get this wrong. Age and sight is what you look at. Anytime bone tumor question comes, hamesha apne ko do cheese. Yes, one more thing about fused trigger, very nice. You'll see that arborizing polyp, right? You'll see the muscle going into the polyp that is arborizing polyp. Okay, coming back here. So bone tumors always a very systematic approach. Look at the site, look at the age. So when you have the epiphysis getting involved, how do I know it's epi and not meta? If it reaches the end of the bone, and then grows here, it is epiphyseal. So any lesion that reaches the end of the bone is an epiphyseal lesion. And age, if the age is 20 to 40 years, very, very specific. If the bone is distal end of radius, three things, it can never be anything else but GCT. Yeah, so the diagnosis is giant cell tumor. It loves to involve the distal end of radius. Age group is going to be 20 to 40 years bone involvement is going to be epiphyseal. The other differential for an epiphyseal lesion, we remember ECG, other differential. So epiphysis, chondroblastoma and giant cell tumor. Chondroblastoma, less than 20 years, giant cell tumor, more than 20 years. So that is how you approach epiphyseal lesions. Giant cell tumor, what is the physiological giant cell of the bone? It is osteoclast. So remember, osteoclastoma is the other name. It is a locally aggressive tumor. Means it can actually erode the cortex and go into the soft tissue. It very rarely metastasizes though. Right? So what is the histopathological counterpart? You're going to see giant cells and you're going to see mononuclear cells. So there are two kinds of cells that you'll see in the histopath. Giant cells dikhenge obviously and you will also have mononuclear cells. So which out of these is responsible for the aggressive behavior for the malignant uh, change? It's the mononuclear cells. So remember it's the mononuclear cells which are malignant. M for malignant, right? It's not the giant cells which are actually responsible for that behavior. Okay, so this is all that we need to know about giant cell tumors. Number 16. What do you see here? So this is a non-contrast CT, uh, CT scan of the brain and you can see that there is this white thing. So anytime you see this hyperdensity on an NCCT, patient will give you a presentation of acute hemiplegia, acute focal neurological deficit. This is a bleed. Is this pontine bleed? No. Anatomy, very important. So this is the level of the basal ganglia. This is the lateral ventricle. These here are your caudate 
nucleus near the frontal horn plus you can see that this is the lentiform nucleus. So there is bleeding in the lentiform nucleus, particularly the outer part of the lentiform nucleus, which is called putamen. So we divide the lentiform nucleus as outer putamen and inner globus pallidus, right? So here the bleeding is into putamen, all right? So you have to have to diagnose this as putaminal bleeding, acute bleed. In the putamen, in an elderly patient, what is the risk factor? Yes, the most common risk factor, hypertension. So remember, basal ganglia bleed. What is the most common site of hypertensive bleed? Karke bhi sawal aata hai. It can be putamen, right? So either ways, they'll ask you what is the risk factor, hypertension, what is the site? Putamen. What is the vessel? Most common vessel to rupture here is actually the lenticulostriate artery, which is a branch of MCA. So lenticulostriate branch of MC is the culprit vessel that you will have here and this is also called as the Charcot's artery because what happens here is that this vessel will have these tiny tiny micro aneurysms which will rupture. Ye tiny micro aneurysms ko hum bolte hain Charcot Bouchard micro aneurysms. So that is why this artery is also called as the Charcot's artery. Fine. Did you understand the pathophysiology? This vessel supplying here to the basal ganglia will develop these microaneurysms because of hypertension. They will rupture and you will have bleed in the putamen. So remember basal ganglia bleed, right? Last image, I think we can stop. So instead of 35, we've done exactly half of what we intended. But is this okay? I mean, I think it's better if we can uh, maybe... I mean, do all of these in detail. The 100 images don't have to end in like three days. We can go for six days also, right? So I think this is better where we can discuss the entire topic uh, rather than, um, you know, quickly finishing these PA image, AA image. I can do that also, but I feel this is better. Yeah. All right. So just the last image and then we can uh, close. Uh, these are two twins, right? Can you see a chota chota baby ke cross section hai do? So these are two fetuses which are your twins. Alright, so this again gets asked a lot. So the first image where you see that this intertwin membrane is very thick. One, it is thick. And second, towards the placenta, it is diverging. So when there is this diversion, you have this angle which is forming. This is called as twin peak sign. This is also referred to as the lambda sign yeah so you have twin peak sign you have the lambda sign that you need to know here and the membrane is going to be thick the intertwin membrane is going to be thick so this diagnosis is when you have both amnion and chorion which are separated dcdo dichorionic diamniotic lambda yeah dichorionic diamniotic on the other hand look at these two fetuses the membrane is very thin and the insertion is like a yeah, so it's not diverging. So when the intertwin membrane is very thin and you have this insertion as a T sign, this means that only the amnion is different, chorion is being shared, the placenta is being shared. So this is MCDA, monochorionic diamniotic twins. Yeah, so this is what you need to know about the two twins, right? Just the diagnosis gets asked here. So do not make this mistake. Fine. Alright, so I think we can stop at this point. 45 to 50 minutes I think is a good enough time for this. So we'll be meeting again tonight at 10 o'clock. Some more radiology where we'll be talking about modalities of identification. I'll post the link on the group uh, before class. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we will meet in original rapid revision. We'll meet a lot of time before that also. Yeah, virtually. Okay, so yeah, yeah I'll give this annotated PDF. Okay, I'll post it on the group once this class is over. Okay. Alright, thank you so much guys. See you all tomorrow on YouTube again and 10 o'clock tonight on the app.